continue in the month of August to have a French hymn, and we invite you to sing both in the French and English, but if you're unable to in the French, please do so in English. This week, we will have on Wednesday night uh, our community-wide gourmet hamburger supper at 6 p.m. Um, it'll be upstairs in Pioneer Hall, and we invite all of you to come. I know it's going to be a particularly hot week, so we are glad we're going to be inside for this event. Saturday morning will be the Community Garden Work Day, and all people who are able to assist with that project, we're going to be getting our garden ready for the fall uh, planting, and also be looking at making some plans for the coming year. Also, you'll note in the insert, um, if you don't have any other plans, I know there will be a wedding here that weekend, but on September 13th, from 3.30 to 7.30 p.m., there will be a great opportunity for fellowship, music, a wonderful meal, and um, activities together with other Presbyterians from around the Presbytery. This insert talks about what's going to happen at Let's Celebrate Taste of Community and encourage you to make plans if you don't have other plans already. Grandfather Home for Children also has an insert on the 24th Annual Children's Golf Classic and encourage you to take that with you. Next Sunday will be Rally Day. There will be breakfast at 9 a.m. next Sunday in Pioneer Hall, followed at 9.30 by our uh, Christian Ed Rally Day Focus, and then we'll have 11 o'clock or 10.55 worship here. I also want to encourage you to fill out the pastor evaluation forms and turn them back in so that the personnel committee may help Mike and myself to be uh, more effective pastors for you all. And then um, you'll note there's a white page insert in the bulletin that goes along with the sermon this morning. This is one to take home, and I'll be making mention of that uh, as we get further into the worship of, of this morning's service. Let us now prepare our hearts for the worship of God. I will say, Marnie is not here this morning. Her brother Rick has, uh, of course we knew, had been diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer but uh, has gone into renal failure, and so she is with him at Grace Hospital this morning. Um, it does not appear good for his prognosis at this point. Now let us worship God.
be called to worship. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. May God unbind our hearts this day and every day. May the Holy Spirit of God pour down upon us. Friends, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ has died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns again and intercedes for us on our behalf. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel, for in Jesus Christ we are all forgiven. Amen.
Good morning. Come on down, you're not late. There are no tardy slips in this church's class right now. Okay, so good to see y'all this morning. Well, this morning our pastor is going to talk about the topic of measuring up in the sermon. Anybody know what that means for you to measure up to something? If I have any ideas? Well, then I'll tell you. Okay. To measure up means to have the ability to do something, to be good enough at something that you can do it well. If you measure up, then, then you're able to do it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about measuring up from your standpoint. First of all, do, you, do your moms and dads ever measure you with a ruler or a tape measure? Anybody ever been measured? Really measured? Why, do you know why they do that? Anybody know? It's to see how tall you are, to make sure you're growing, to make sure that you're growing properly, and your doctors do that too. And has anybody ever gone and gone to like Carowinds or to the rides at the Drexel Fair or anywhere like that, and there's a sign that says, you must be this tall to ride this ride. Have you ever seen that? Have you? Have you seen those signs where you have to be that tall? So that's making sure that you're tall enough that you won't fly out of that ride or get hurt in some way. So they measure you. They measure you up. And then how many of you will be starting school in about a week? Who all is going back to school? Either a BB bus or anything or school, school. Are y'all not going? <laughs> As everybody said, no, we're just not going to school. <laughs> well, I've kind of thought about it, but I just don't have much choice. So anyway, if um, when you go to school, sometimes they'll give you these little quizzes or tests or assessments, we call them sometimes in big people language. And when we do that in school, we're trying to measure what you know. Now, the thing about these tests and these assessments is that you're not always going to do great on them. You know, you don't, you're not always going to be the best in math. You're not always going to be the best in spelling or the best in reading. You want to do your very best on any test you take, but it's okay if you don't quite measure up every once in a while. It's okay if your strength is spelling and your strength is math because those everybody's different. Just like if we all stood up, we're all different heights. And these adults who finish growing, if they stood up, they're all different heights. But that doesn't mean that they can't do whatever their gifts are. You know, and so God is going to use the best of you, and he's going to use the worst of you sometimes. He's going to find some gifts and some talents in you and some things you can do that other people might not think are your best gifts. And he's going to use them for his good and to share Jesus with the world. Okay, so let's say a little prayer. Father God, we come to you today extremely happy to see all these beautiful, shining, young faces in front of us. We ask your blessings upon them. Most of all, Father, we ask them, we ask you to remind them constantly that you are going to use their gifts. Their gifts that they think are good and strong and their gifts that maybe are not their favorite gifts or not their best gifts, but you will use them to your glory. Help all of us to go out of this sanctuary today to be the people you want us to be. Amen. We come in time to our pastoral prayer. I want to share with you some concerns that we're aware of this week. Janet Michael will be going in tomorrow morning for knee surgery and knee replacement. Linda Braswell has been at a wound center, a 
um, in Swannanoa for several weeks now and will continue to be there for several more weeks for healing. We're grateful to know of Bill Brinkley's um, prognosis and the result of his surgery. He has confirmed that there's circulation in his foot. We also lift up Truett Baird, who has been diagnosed with cancer. We ask you to keep him in, our, in your prayers as he determines and finds out with the surgeons what, and the doctors what are the uh, continued next steps. Then uh, Marnie Tabor's brother, Rick Potter, um, as I mentioned earlier, he's had renal failure last night and is in critical care in the uh, Grace Hospital. But also um, want to lift up um, Jan and Timo's son, Charles, and uh, Timo's daughter, is it Teresa? Or Yes. So both of them have been diagnosed with cancer and we need to keep them in our prayers as well. And then uh, also uh, Alberta's brother, Bud, as uh, we keep him in our prayers as he's in declining health at this time. Are there any other concerns that we want to lift up at this time? Yes. Yes. It's always good to hear when prayer does make a difference in people's lives, and we're grateful to hear of Tracy's improvement, Tracy Hipman. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Lord, on this holy day in which we set aside from the busyness of our own lives to do the work of the people of God to pray, we often don't think of prayer as being work. And sometimes we fail to recognize its importance, and yet you call us to pray daily for daily bread and for daily deliverance. You call us into a relationship with you, O oh God, of trust and openness, even when our doubts cloud and confuse our thinking. You call us to turn to you again and again in the relationship that we have because of Christ and because of his profound love for us. And so we do. We turn to you, God, with the concerns that we have in our heart for church members and for friends of this community of faith and for children, members who are not able to be with us and for children of church members who are living elsewhere. For all of these and more, Lord, we lift our voices to you, asking for your intervention in their lives, especially where cancer is concerned. First and foremost, bring them the peace of Christ to help them to know that you're always with them. Bring them hope so that as they face their crisis, they face it with you and not alone. And bring them the compassionate love of others who lift up those individuals in prayer and offer words of comfort and gestures of support. Lord, we pray on this day for Christians in the Middle East who find their lives on the line and often we hear of persecutions going on that are horrendous from and a level of evil and malevolence in humanity that is hard to understand. And we need to be clean and rid of it. Oh God, we ask your help and your guidance. We pray your comfort and your protection for all those who are persecuted, whether they are Christian or Muslim or anyone who is being charged as being worthy of being killed because of someone's foolish decision. Direct us, God, and direct this world towards peace, 
We pray for peace in the Middle East and are grateful for a time of respite and a lack of warfare between Israel and Palestine, and we ask that you will bring about a lasting peace there. We pray for race relations in this country in a week in which we've seen one town explode in violence. Lord, we know what your will is for humanity. We know we are called to get along and to be peaceful with each other. We know we are called to listen to each other and to learn from each other's perspective and concerns. And as we saw the beginnings of that this week in Ferguson, Missouri, we ask you to continue to bring about hope and restoration towards peace. All these things we lift to you, God, because of our relationship with you in Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, and who calls us to be agents of your love and your peace in this world. Direct us in all that we do and enable us to live life fully with joy, with hope, and guided by love. For we offer this prayer in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
turn to you and to a story that is old and familiar. We ask for new insights so that our lives may be heightened and sharpened to the understanding of your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Acts 9. As soon as you hear this, you will recognize its familiarity, one of the most familiar stories of the Bible. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my instrument, whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord.
next six weeks, I'm going to be focusing on the theme of sharing our faith as Presbyterians. That seems to be something that we don't do easily as Presbyterians, and yet all of us as Christians are called to do that. And so you received yesterday in the mail postcards with a scripture passage and a chance to pray this week around that scripture and answer the question on the card. Keep those cards until we have our church-wide retreat in September on the 20th, and we will be using them at that time. But there's, there's another exercise here that I want to call your attention to in the bulletin. It is an outline of this sermon with some questions that go along with it. And take that home with you and let, let this next six weeks be a time of spiritual growth for you as you study the scripture, as you enter into prayer, and you respond with your thoughts on the cards. Those of us who've grown up in the church have long heard the story of Paul and his conversion. But truth be told, those of us who have grown up in the church often find that we are a little bit uneasy about the story of conversion because it seems so foreign from our own lives. Now, chances are, if you've grown up in the church, you've come to accept Christ as Lord and have never had those great, absolutely dramatic events that happened to Paul. Paul did not grow up in the church. In fact, he, he was a very devout Jew, but he also was persecuting those who were Christians, and that was his call. In fact, he had stood by and held the coats for those who were stoning Stephen. We know of that story earlier in Acts, the stoning of Stephen because he would not give up his faith in Christ. Ironically, that the world would be facing some of the same threats of persecution and the same death threats Christians in the Middle East today. But this story causes us a degree of discomfort. Most of us look at the story of the conversion of Paul as being a bit off-putting, because if we measure ourselves by that, and that God acts through Christians' lives in such a way as to create a Damascus Road experience, and we look at ourselves and we don't have it, we wonder what's wrong with my faith. At the conclusion of his re-education, something like scales fell from Paul's eyes and he regained his sight. And he went on to become one of the greatest preachers ever and the great theologian of the early church. Now that is dramatic stuff. Who, who can relate? wonder if my faith is so watered down that I really don't attract the attention of God in a dramatic way to help to bring such an event in my life. But let's focus on something that we can relate to, and that is the personality of Paul and some of his underlying decisions and choices that we can connect with. Now, I know it's probably very difficult to come up with a name in this congregation, but I'll ask the question anyway. Do you know of anyone who's headstrong or stubborn? <laughs> well, I've heard that term they used to describe Waldensians and Presbyterians and people from, from German background and Irish background. Those who use a computer, those who were former Baptists, those who are teenagers. No, you know what? Being headstrong and stubborn is about as human as you can get, because we're all made that way. We all head down a particular path and think this is the right way for me to go. And so it's not so much one group of people as much as it is a universal human thing. And that's where we find our connecting point with Paul. Headstrong, stubborn, 
determined, strong-willed Paul. The hard-driving businesswoman who's so determined to get ahead and promoted in her work that she does serious damage to her marriage without realizing it. The man who has suppressed his emotional vulnerability so long in fear of being perceived as being weak that he cannot effectively share his love for his wife. The teenager who is so filled with his anger and hurt towards his parents that there is no room for forgiveness, he is indignant. The school bully trying to establish his dominance and self-worth at the expense of other children. The partisan political leader who is unable to hear any truth of opinion other than those that match his own. The relentless, hard-driving parent who will not give his or her child a break. Yes, we are, as human beings, stubborn, strong-willed, obstinate people. When we take time to recognize the issues that cause a Damascus Road experience for Paul, we can suddenly relate to that. Because we see many of those underlying factors playing out in our own lives. We too have been blinded to the impact of our actions, haven't we? In a way that's a lot like Paul. The truth of the matter is that on this level we've all fallen short. All walked the path of closed-mindedness, haven't we? And oftentimes we put off addressing the internal causes that impact our actions and choices until a crisis occurs. And in that respect, we're also like Paul. A crisis occurred in his life. He was doing what he thought was right, and he was walking that path, and he was heading to Damascus, and a crisis occurred when he was made blind. But what happens in our lives when a crisis occurs and we suddenly look at the implications of our stubbornness and our strong-willed nature and our obstinance. Maybe it's a child who says, you have not been present for me. Maybe it's something in the middle of the night that keeps us unsettled and awake and struggling with life to make sense out of again. It all seemed to be so easy for a long time and suddenly my life seems turned upside down and there is no order. Where is peace for me? And when we look strong and long and hard at ourselves, we realize we have ourselves to blame. How many times in your life have you had that experience? Whatever gets our attention, like Paul, there are those moments in our lives when we come face to face with the impact of our wrongdoing and what it has done to our relationships or to our sense of self or to our calling, profession, or whatever. And out of the blue, a voice says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? Saul was blinded by the very hand of God and led by his hand to Damascus, creating a crisis that would get his attention in a big way. Have you ever heard that voice? Kevin, Kevin, look at what you have done. How many times in your life have you come to the full recognition of the impact of wrongdoing that you have played out in the lives of those you love? When was the last time when you were confronted with the impact of the blindness of your own actions? When the overwhelming truth made you feel so very vulnerable that you had to rely on someone else because you knew, I don't know how to act. turn maybe to a spouse or maybe to a professional counselor or somewhere for help that we can't give ourselves and certainly we turn in prayer to God for direction. If that's starting to sound terribly personal to you, it is 
because we're all there as human beings. Most of us may not be able to relate to the dramatic turn of events in the life of Paul, starting out with killing Christian martyrs, to being blinded on a road, to having a direct encounter with the risen Lord and his messenger, whose prayer was to restore his sight, not just his visible sight, but his sight about who God is and what God wills for his life. In a way, that seems so foreign to us, but when we connect with the real issues underneath, the stubbornness, the obstinance, oh yeah, we see ourselves there. But if we connect with this stubbornness of character in the situation that awakened Paul to his wrongdoing, then we certainly recognize the parallels in our own story. There are those moments, just as for Paul, moments that point to which we look hard enough that we can see the presence of God confronting us with the need to redirect our lives, to let go of the control, to become more vulnerable and humble, and to be far less defensive. All of us have strong-willed natures. That's why the way we were made as human beings. It's what sets us apart. It, it helps to give us drive and motivation and direction in life. But it can also have that downside. And the catalyst for change might have been an honest friend or a confronting spouse or that courageous child who pushes the issue to desire genuine change. But we have to also ask, what role does God play in that? How has God helped you in your life to address the wrong? Are you open to God's healing presence to restore and rebuild your life? Many people experience the presence of God in those crucible moments when we realize we cannot continue in the same track, but we don't know how to act. Emily Griffin writes in her book, Turning Reflections on the Experience of Conversion. She says this, it is clear that conversion begins with the restlessness of the human heart, which can find no resting place on earth. And so those events come up and they well up be in our relationships with each other, but those events also well up in our relationship with God. And we turn to God for direction for sustenance as we make the next steps, even though we're still blind. As Paul made steps for days and heard the voice of Ananias telling him about who he had persecuted and giving him a sense of direction and hope that the very one he persecuted was a God of love in Christ. We have to be led by the hand, to be directed by someone else, to listen to God and God's movement in the midst of our lives and in the lives of those who talk to us. Bringing about transformation and new life to our lives, even and especially when we think we have no options left. Oh yes, I wish as many of us do, that someone had spoken to Robin Williams and said there's still an option left. When we step back to evaluate the underlying issues beneath the surface of Paul's life, we can see those threads of connection, and those are the ones that help us to recognize as God did it for Paul, God will bring about change and transformation in our own lives as well. We need not go down a path that seems endless, without direction, without hope, if we turn to God. Learning how to focus on God in those times in our lives when we hit the brick walls, when we're confronted by our own blindness and stubbornness and shortcomings, then we're able to think through the conversions in our own lives. Conversions from self-centeredness to openness, from a focus upon our own agenda to becoming disciples, 
from obstinacy to generosity of spirit. You know what? To be human is to come up short. We all know that. But to be Christian is to recognize our need to turn our shortness, our vulnerability, our obstinance all over to God for direction to an even greater life in this world. To be forgiven as a child of God, forgiven by God and by those we love, is to be given the opportunity to show how the light of Christ has worked in our lives and given the opportunity to share that story with those we love and maybe even with those we come in contact with. It is those moments that we can see that the path of Paul really has parallel in our lives. I invite you to explore that in your life this week, in your prayer time, in your devotion time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please stand and join with me in the affirmation of faith this morning coming from the 1991 Brief Statement of Faith of the Presbyterian Church. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We are blessed in this congregation with a child of this church who's grown up in this church and become a young woman and feels called by God, called by God to share her life as a volunteer, young adult volunteer in Zambia for the next year. So I'd like to call Rebecca Heilman forward as Frank Grill, our clerk of session, and I commission Rebecca to her ministry. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are called by God to be the church of Jesus Christ, a sign in the world today of what God intends for all humankind. The great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven in the world. The call of Christ is to willing, dedicated discipleship. Our discipleship is a manifestation of the new life we enter through baptism. Discipleship is both a gift and a commitment, an offering and a responsibility. Rebecca Heilman has been selected by the Mission Division of the General Assembly of the PCUSA to serve as a young adult volunteer in Zambia. Rebecca?
grace bestowed on you, Rebecca, in baptism is sufficient for your calling because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in the faith and to commit our lives in ways that serve Jesus Christ. God has called you to a particular service. Show your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please say, I will with God's help. And do you welcome the responsibility of this service because you are determined to follow the Lord Jesus and love to love neighbors and to work for the reconciling of the world? Will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I will with God's help. Do you, members of Walt Ancient Presbyterian Church, confirm the call of God? To our sister Rebecca Heilman as a youth adult volunteer in Zambia for the next 12 months in the service of Christ Jesus. If so, please say, we do. Yeah. Will you support and encourage her in this ministry? If so, please say, we do. Yeah. Rebecca has also received notice that when she returns from Zambia, she will be uh, going into Union Presbyterian Seminary with full scholarship to attend and attain a master's degree. Let us pray together. Faithful God, in baptism you claim us, and by your Holy Spirit you're working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Rebecca to this time and place, establish in her your truth, guide her by your Holy Spirit, that in your service she may know in faith, hope, and love, and be faithful, a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Rebecca, you are commissioned to serve as a young adult volunteer in Zambia. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God for him. And Rebecca, may the God of peace guide you every step of your way. Know that the love of this church surrounds you and we'll be with you. And that we'll be following your blog closely. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> Rebecca leaves tomorrow. With thanksgiving in our hearts, we offer our gifts of gratitude to God.
and in your redemption in our lives we find great hope and meaning and purpose. Use these gifts and use our lives that others may know the same joy in Jesus Christ. Amen.
cannot really